I would like to wish uh, everybody a good evening. My name is Tim, and it's going to be Andy Anderson will be moderating tonight, but I'm going to be introducing everybody on the college. The college consists of the following three formats. We first have a brief announcement session, then we have our speaker speaking, then we have a question and answer session where we, where we request that you keep it to a question. Afterwards, we have our infamous rebuttal period. Tonight, the topic is coping with holiday depression. And I'm forgetting the speaker's name right now. Yeah. Dan Bader, going to be the speaker. Dan Bader for preventing holiday depression. So, Tim forgot to mention, you know, we, we have uh, two rules at the college. Uh, one fool at a time speaking, and we don't insult anybody's mama or next of kin or anything else. Try to keep it civil. Let's In the past introduce week, our speaker, Dan Bader. I'm going to be giving a presentation on depression. I hope to be able to convey to everybody some things that you normally may not be aware of or pay attention to. Most people in the country know what depression is in some sense. Usually, though, it's kind of vague. Um, so I'm going to try to elucidate, explain some things that you really should pay attention to if you don't want to get into a lot of trouble in the mental health system. And that's very easy uh, to happen. So the first slide we have here is Batman. And, uh, you know, Batman uh, had a very traumatic childhood. Can you... Tell us what the initials are. Oh, all right. Uh, those initials uh, are licensed initials, licensed clinical professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, I work for uh, Department of Public Health, uh, City of Chicago Department of Public Health, and I worked in other community uh, mental health centers, all told about uh, 23 years. And uh, I recently retired, and I'm going to say something about that when I get to do the final rebuttal or conclusion. And if anybody has any questions about the state of mental health, community, or public health, please ask me during the, uh, during the questions. Now, I, uh, you know, put Batman up here. You know, it says, a cape figure awakens from sleep stirs listlessly and he's thinking funny I don't feel like doing anything at all today don't even want to get up and the idea is that somehow Batman is depressed and I would point out since Batman is depressed that uh, the prevalence of depression uh, based on uh, the psychiatric Bible known as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, is about uh, 47 to 50 percent of the population. That's a lifetime prevalence. That means that, you know, half of you in this room have probably had a depressive episode or will have one, and some of you may have a number, and I'm going to really talk about that uh, kind of carefully. Okay, so uh, again, Batman uh, is depressed. The prevalence of depression, very high. Right, now we're going to move to diagnosis, which I'm going to go over kind of carefully. The first thing we have here is uh, the prospective client says, I feel depressed. You want to walk outside? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Keep it okay. civil. Hold on. Try, try, try to keep it civil, people. Yes. Try to keep you it civil. You want to go outside, Uncle? said we didn't have to go there. Come on, let's go. Hey, guys, could you please let me, let me continue, please. Um, all right. So the prospective client says, I feel depressed, no interest in activities, have weight loss, insomnia, and tired, 
and think about suicide. Those are symptoms of depression. The therapist, who may be a psychiatrist, I suspect, you know, says, I diagnose you with depression. There's been a diagnosis rendered based on those symptoms. Okay. She says, I know, uh, I already know I feel depressed. But now that I officially have diagnosed you, says the psychiatrist, we can treat the chemical imbalance in your brain with drugs. That's a cartoon, but it's not that far from what happens in reality. And, I, and that's important to understand. That's a diagnosis. You go into a psychiatrist or a therapist, you tell them, I'm sad, I don't, you know, I'm tired, I'm not sleeping well, I'm fatigued. I have low self-esteem. You know, before you know it, you've got it, and I've been feeling that way for more than two weeks. Before you know it, you have a depression diagnosis. And that's pretty consequential in this world and getting more so. Okay. So, all right, you have a large, I believe, uh, handout on this one, a slide. Uh, now this represents the five axes of a DSM mental health diagnosis from 1980 through 2013. This was a framework, multi-axial system, which was around again from 1980 to 2013. Uh, in 2013, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual was revised and they eliminated this framework. And that's not a minor thing, it's, it's actually uh, from my point of view and a lot of people, it's very regrettable that they did this. Uh, but let's look at this one because it, it still uh, kind of prevails in most uh, clinicians' minds. Axis one was signs and symptoms. And that was the axis, the dimension, where you would be given a diagnosis that could be paid for by insurance. You know, and you could also then get medication prescribed to you legitimately. <clears throat> so up there you have anxiety disorders, mood disorders, psychotic disorders, etc., including major depressive disorder, which we're going to look at kind of carefully. Axis two was essentially dysfunctional behavior patterns, personality disorders. Axis two basically was long-standing cross-situational symptoms very similar to what you had on axis one. If you got a diagnosis on axis two, insurance would not pay for it. That would be like, you know, the famous borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, that kind of uh, disorder. Axis three would be medical diagnoses and conditions. That could be a uh, cancer, a heart disease, diabetes. It also could be uh, nutritional deficiencies. There's a number of disorders that are nutritional deficiencies. Could be blood sugar issues. Uh, a lot of people who have diabetes or pre-diabetes have blood sugar dysregulation problems. Sugar goes up and down. Um, and you could have hormonal imbalances. Thyroid imbalance is a famous one. Uh, and there's numerous others. Axis four was psychosocial environmental stressors. This was originally conceived in 1980. That was coming off of the 1960s and the 1970s when there were some very uh, major changes happening in the world of mental health. Uh, the old psychodynamic uh, perspective which predominated in the 1950s and into the 60s uh, was basically, it was kind of a, you know, psychiatrist did talk therapy for very expensive prices and insurance didn't pay for any of it. That would be, you know, maybe down on Michigan Avenue here in Chicago. But it was being proven not to be very effective and that was upsetting the psychiatrist. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, we had a, a DSM, a manual in 1952, which 
was very slim, and it basically divided mental health up into uh, really two big categories, psychosis and what they call neurosis. So, uh, you know, if you were psychotic, you would be probably, sooner or later, you would find yourself in a psychiatric hospital, you know, a state hospital like we used to have out in Elgin, Elgin State Hospital. Yeah. Tim, Tim. Um, and if you were neurotic, you might get therapy if you could afford it, or you might just deal with it as best you can uh, in other ways. In 1968, they revised it again because at that point in time, the first medications beyond the antipsychotic medications, which you would get in the hospital, had kind of come into play. They used to have a minor tranquilizer called Milltown, I believe, uh, which was for anxiety problems, and they had uh, uh, some antidepressants, first generation, coming online. So they revised it in 1968 somewhat, but it was still very similar to the first one. But psychiatrists were very, very worried, as you would be if you thought you might not be able to continue to make the kind of living you expected to make with your degree. So they made a decision, uh, which was crystallized in this 1980 uh, uh, DSM, to essentially become uh, uh, concerned with the biological, biochemical underpinnings of mental illness and to essentially go over to prescribing medication rather than uh, doing talk therapy, which was really kind of going out uh, of style as they did it. So uh, this was though a holdover again from the 1960s, 1970s, uh, where you know you had a lot of uh, things going on in, in the country. Uh, there were many people speaking out against some of the coercive aspects of mental health. And this multi-axial framework was meant to capture uh, essentially, uh, forgot about axis five, uh, was meant to capture the things that go into creating a diagnosis up on axis one. And uh, so uh, let's look, um, again, Axis 5, by the way, is just simply that was considered to be your level of functioning, how well a person could function with whatever problems or symptoms they had. Okay. So just to bring us up to date quickly, in 2013, again, that was changed. They got rid of the multi-axial system, which was a very valuable way of conceptualizing what was going on with a person. They didn't really give any good reasons for it. You know, they gave a couple of, you know, well, uh, we don't really use access to diagnoses. They don't get paid for by insurance. Actually, the symptoms are very similar to what we would put up on Axis 1. And, uh, you know, we're just going to... Uh, We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, <clears throat> make these changes. Now, uh, diagnoses that were previously listed on axes 1 to 3 were listed without reference to an axial dimension because it didn't exist. Axis 4, uh, environmental psychosocial stressors, that can precipitate, cause, and maintain a lot of depressive problems was downgraded to a contextual status. And that's significant. You may not, you know, you might say, well, they're still going to think of that. But by downgrading it in this way, it tends to minimize its importance and it allows more of an emphasis to be put on the money. And the money is made primarily through the pharmaceutical industry and uh, the medications that they produce, market, and the psychiatrists who prescribe them. Um, you know, and then uh, I just point out there, the National Institute of Mental Health rejected DSM-5 disorder definitions as a guide to the setting of research priorities. Lack of diagnostic validity was cited as the reason. Again, that's 
and that's an important thing to understand. Now, I think as we go through depression, and I'm going to go over major depressive disorder, you'll see uh, uh, you know, some of the reasons why it might be rejected. All right. Just briefly, and I got a lot to go through, and I know that time is limited. So, I, uh, this is uh, multi-causality of disorders, uh, and I'm just going to kind of jump over this. You can look at it; uh, you have it, uh, you know, on on your slides. Um, and I've all, already kind of stated some of that. All right. This slide is, uh, you know, vicious cycle positive feedback loop. This is what you really need to realize. And it should be explained to anybody who's going into treatment. Now, they don't use the multi-axial system anymore, but this explanation can still be given. It should be right at assessment. All right, so if you have symptoms on axis one, I'm sad, I'm anxious, I don't want to go out of the house, I'm hearing voices, uh, my self-esteem is low, everybody hates me, you know, you give your symptoms, they will give you uh, a disorder. And uh, what we need to notice is that uh, if you have symptoms on axis one, they are troublesome. Uh, but it makes it very difficult to address axis three and axis four problems. Axis four are the stressors in your life. Maybe you're living in poverty. You know, if you're living in poverty, I guarantee you, you will have symptoms up on axis one. No, you know, there's no way you could avoid it. Um, so problems on axis three and four can worsen over time if you're not able to do something. If you can't take care of your medical nutritional issues, if you're not able to do it because you have too much anxiety, you're sad, uh, you know, you're kind of deflated, and you're not taking care of it, they're just going to get worse. Uh, so we want to understand that, the, you know, there's kind of a feedback here. And if you have a lot of problems uh, that, uh, as we're going to go into on axis three and four, I, I got to remember, I got to remember how this works. Um, okay, so there we go. And it points out here, therapy is useful when you have signs and symptoms up on axis one. It's very useful and probably necessary in a lot of cases, or at least the education that you would get in therapy is necessary. Uh, for problems down on three and four, medical and case management interventions can, can be helpful. Okay, so treatment, again, I'm not going to go over this. I'm just going to say uh, that medication, if it works, and this is important, can only partially anesthetize the emotional pain that manifests as symptoms. You know, so if you take them, you know, everybody knows what drugs are like. These medications are simply drugs. Most antidepressant medications that they have on the market today, the uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, etc., they're, they're mildly stimulating drugs. They produce a certain kind of emotional state much like if you were drinking coffee, you know, you're going to get a little change in your mood. Um, so you can take a medication, and some other medications, of course, you know, produce other kinds of uh, emotional states. They generally will uh, suppress, to some degree if they work, emotional pain in general. And maybe all of your emotions, both good and bad, unfortunately, some of them. Okay, and uh, informed consent, which means your therapist or your psychiatrist has to discuss these things with you. And a lot of times in the real world, they just don't do it. It's just like in that little cartoon at the beginning. You're depressed? Fine, I diagnose you, and now I'm going to give you medication to take care of your uh, mental health problem. Okay, now... Uh, axis three, treatment efficacy entails, requires, necessitates the factoring out of axis three problems as soon as possible. Just use common sense. If you have medical problems that are causing you to have symptoms up on axis one, 
like anxiety, depressive symptoms, even psychotic symptoms in some cases. Do you really want to get on the medication trail uh, without factoring out, removing any medical problems that you may have? And this should be done. And, uh, you know, in textbooks for a long time, you know, that they would uh, say something like, well, everybody should be screened for a thyroid problem. You know, because that will cause you, you know, if you have uh, 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 your thyroid hormone is low, you're going to get depressed. But again, in reality, in the real world, especially in community mental health world, uh, it does not happen, and it really doesn't happen uh, in most places at all. But if you want to take care of yourself, you want to get any kind of medical, nutritional, hormonal issues taken care of before you start taking medication. All right. Now, I'm giving you a reference here. You have it on a slide. This is a very good cover of research on micronutrient deficiencies and depression. You can get it on the Man in America website, which is an excellent website uh, for uh, mental health issues. And, uh, you know, it will talk about how you really need all of the micronutrients, both the vitamins and the minerals, and uh, it's essential for all of them. They're kind of cofactors. If you want to have your neurotransmitters uh, functioning as they should be, you need to do that. And, uh, you know, most people that I encounter, and I have done this for years, I will ask uh, a client, do you take a multivitamin? And really, most of the time, the answer is no. You know, you don't take a multivitamin. That means uh, you're really endangering your health in all sorts of ways, and you cannot get these nutrients anymore out of a good, healthy diet, the food that you eat. So it's essential. I would, you know, you can just go on the website. They give it's a three-part webinar. It's really good, and it will explain micronutrients and, and mental health very well. Okay. This is a good cover for of research on inflammation and depression. It's by Kelly Brogan. She also has a website. Uh, this will talk about uh, problems with your macronutrients, you know, mostly the kind of food that you eat, that you consume. And uh, if you have inflammation problems, you read this or you check out our website, you, it'll become clear to you that diet uh, is very, very important if you want to avoid uh, taking medication, uh, and uh, I, I would highly recommend this. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I, you know, a uh, few hormonal imbalance examples. I mentioned thyroid imbalance can precipitate and maintain psychiatric symptoms. Uh, hyperthyroidism can produce emotional lability, <coughs> low frustration tolerance, intermittent sadness, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, and if it's really bad, psychosis. So how could anybody want to go into treatment without having that checked? I mean, it's just absurd, and it won't happen unless you insist that it get done. Um, you know, and, and, and so we have hypothyroidism can produce loss of interest, sadness, fatigue, attention, concentration problems, paranoid ideation, and psychosis if it's severe in some people. So again, you know, you, you want to have a check. I mentioned seasonal affective disorder is associated with an excessive release of the pineal hormone melatonin. And I mentioned light and or vitamin D inhibits the release of melatonin. And that's a lot of times what's recommended for that. And if you know you get that way when uh, the late fall and the winter come on, you know, you should try to make some adjustments and, and uh, not get struck with it. Um, postpartum depression, I didn't put there, but that's another uh, issue. And, and generally speaking, what that's associated with is various micronutrient deficiencies that have occurred during the pregnancy because, you know, the uh, fetus is taking a lot of the nutritional value. And, uh, you know, in order for the neurotransmitters, which are always talked about, in the brain to be functioning well, you have to have adequate nutrition. Okay, so that's hormonal imbalances. 
blood sugar dysregulation. High blood sugar can produce irritability, fatigue, and concentration problems. Low blood sugar can produce irritability and anger control, anger control difficulties, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, and attention concentration problems. So, you know, especially if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, you know, you want to make sure that this isn't getting you into trouble. Unfortunately, and I, I give a quick example, uh, not a depression example, but you know, in, in school these days, uh, many, many children are getting diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But they're going into school, maybe they didn't eat breakfast, or maybe they're eating sweets, or drinking, you know, some Kool-Aid type beverage that they do. They're going to get their blood sugar spiked way up, and then it's going to go down. And they're going to have these problems. But what happens to them these days? A um, person is too fidgety, they're disrupting the class, they're not concentrating. So you know what? They're going to get diagnosed with the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and the teacher will probably coerce the parents to go ahead and, you know, get them checked out by a psychiatrist. And then comes the medication. And what does that mean? That means that, you know, say a child who's 8, 9, 10, 11 years old will be prescribed amphetamine, adenine, which is amphetamine. It, it's a, uh, you know, it's a tightly controlled drug out on the streets. If you're passing it on, you may get charged with a felony. But they're going to give it to the children. And that's an amphetamine. But you know, that causes a problem because Adderall has a half-life. That means when 50% of it is out of your system, like with any drug, you start to go into a little bit of withdrawal. The drug is wearing off. So if the child takes it in the morning, and then it's dinner time, well, now they're going to be having a problem. They're going to be kind of hyperactive, and they're going to be feeling a little bit of the withdrawal from the amphetamine, the Adderall. So then what has to happen? Then we give them another drug so they can go to sleep, because you can't give them another Adderall at 6 o'clock at night or they can't sleep. So they will give them something, I hate to say it, but it's true. They may give them something like an antipsychotic medication to put them to sleep, like Risperdal. And there you have a young child taking amphetamine during the day, taking an antipsychotic drug, powerful drug, powerful drug so they can go to sleep and be calm at night. So again, these things, axis three, medical issues, nutritional deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, blood sugar dysregulation problems, you want to get that factored out of the equation before you start taking medication. The only time you should take medication without having that completely checked out would be if you're suffering a breakdown, you know, you're full you know, you're having a full-blown breakdown, and you just need to be calmed down so that you don't get in a lot of trouble. Uh, that's pretty much it. And, and other than that, this should be done, and uh, again, it should be discussed. Okay, treatment for axis four. Uh, I'm just going to let you, you know, you can kind of look at this. Uh, I do just point out that, uh, uh, you know, if you... Uh, uh, have problems in your environment, if you're living in poverty, you're isolated, you don't have friends, you have no community involvement, you're not doing anything uh, to improve yourself as a person, don't be surprised if you get depressed. Yeah, you will. Okay. All right, Axis 5 level of functioning. This just points out uh, that some people when they are depressed, they, for some reason they get a diagnosis, uh, they can still function very, very well. Other people can't. So you can look at that. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is I put up, uh, you know, uh, depression and need deficiencies. And this is, uh, you know, some of you may remember, you know, Abram Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Long time ago, you know, back all the way back to the 50s, 60s, etc. And uh, so, what we do need to look at, what you know, the needs. Okay. All right. This is a, a slide I use in a lot of different presentations, 
but uh, I want to just go over it quickly. The, the, the conscious mind is essentially, our conscious mind is rooted in the modern world, uh, you know, and that is modern technology, hospitals, supermarkets, shelters, telephone numbers, etc. We know we can call 911 if we're, you know, injured, sick, and we can get taken care of by doctors and nurses or somebody. Um, the unconscious mind is rooted in a hunting, gathering, foraging world, a tribal world consisting of uh, families banded together. It is not aware of the modern world. That's what we evolved, or if you like, we were created to exist in. And, uh, you know, that's how we are emotionally. So even though, you know, somebody could say, uh, I don't need any friends, I don't need anybody in my life because I've got enough income coming in, and, uh, you know, I like being, I've been hurt by people before, I'm going to stay by myself, be safe. Unfortunately, you will get a lot of emotional pain because your unconscious mind doesn't understand that physically you can stay alive in the modern world and isolate, for example. Uh, you couldn't do that in a, you know, in a tribal world. If you get sick or injured, somebody has to carry you attend to you, protect you, and if you don't have those people, you know, you won't survive. Okay, uh, the need deficiencies and chronic emotional pain. You have a, uh, a slide on this, I think you have a large one too. Uh, now need deficiencies, as I break them down, and they can be broken down in different ways, but, you know, financial instability, poor emotional support, lack of community involvement, and neglected individual development. Uh, and we want to understand, it, and I'm going to define them, uh, if you have a deficiency in one of these need areas, you're going to have chronic emotional pain. And uh, chronic emotional pain will come daily, generally. Um, and it doesn't matter what happens. You know, uh, uh, the difference between everyday emotional pain and chronic emotional pain is if I'm waiting for a bus and it doesn't come, I get frustrated, uh, and I'm feeling some anger irritability. That's everyday pain. If somebody insults me, I'm going to feel the pain of, of the insult. That's everyday pain. But chronic emotional pain will come regardless of what goes on day to day. And there's a lot of things we can do to try to anesthetize that chronic pain. But a lot of that can be very problematic. Um, and uh, so you can look at that. All right. If you three outcomes that result from chronic emotional pain. And this is a significant. Yeah, a um, one is an emotional breakdown. If you have chronic emotional pain and you are not able to anesthetize it by smoking cigarettes, watching TV, uh, drinking alcohol, you know, doing something uh, to kill that pain, um, you can suffer a breakdown. And a breakdown in very simple terms is a series of emotionally driven bad decisions and impulsive actions that get you consequences in the real world. You know, and how do they end? They usually end with a psychiatric hospitalization and incarceration because you break the law when uh, you are uh, breaking down, you injure yourself or somebody else, uh, and uh, you know, suicide, or you destroy key relationships in your life. That's a breakdown. Uh, uh, so the second thing that can happen if you're suffering chronic emotional pain is you, you evolve a maladaptive lifestyle, frequently addictive. You know, a lot of these addictions are basically attempts on the part of people to anesthetize, at least partially, temporarily, this chronic emotional pain. Uh, and, uh, that, that needs to be uh, considered. Now, the third one is the way to go, the remediation of the need deficiencies that generate chronic emotional pain. And I'll say for, you know, if you're thinking about the holidays, if you have serious need deficiencies in your life, when the holidays come, that's going to be intensified. And what the answer is, uh, uh, as best you can, uh, remove, you know, for example, if you're a person who does not have a community involvement, you don't belong to any groups, you know, cooperating to try to accomplish some sort of a goal. Go ahead and get in something. Volunteer. 
you will be well rewarded for, for doing that, and it will help a lot. All right. Financial material stability is one, you know, concern, uh, you know, and this is, uh, it's in place if you and your family, if you have a family, can reliably obtain the necessities of life. That's housing, food, clothing, medical care, and in the modern world, I don't know, you know, telephones, TV, I, whatever you consider to be the necessities in a certain sense, you want to have them in place. Um, you know, and if chronic financial instability is not remediated, a full-blown depressive de breakdown can occur, and other types of breakdowns. Okay. Uh, emotional support, it essentially means you've got four to six people. If you have three, it's not going to be a tragedy. If you have two, it becomes a little more problematic. If you have one, it's a huge problem or zero. And, and that is just, you know, you're, you're attached to people. You know, whether they're friends, associates, family, significant other, you have these attachments and they're based on a, on a bond, you know. If I'm in trouble and you'll, you, you know, you'll do whatever you can to help me out and I will do the same for you. That is an emotional support person. Okay, now I, I capitalize some things in your handout. And some of it is going to be connected with, if you don't have emotional support at all, that is a huge risk factor for suicide. And, and it's just something to know. And I'll, I will talk about suicide. Okay. Community involvement. Uh, you know, it's a, you're a contributing member of a group cooperating together in order to achieve a goal or carry out a mission. Uh, it's essential that you, if you do not belong to something, try to do that. Otherwise, you will suffer chronic emotional pain, and you're also, you know, always going to be suffering some everyday pain. And that is also a risk factor for suicide. No community involvement. Individual development. Um, individual development is in place if you are acquiring new skills or improving skill sets you've already assimilated. This is concerned with the acquisition of knowledge and skills for dealing with the environment. And as always, you know, with all of these need areas, the unconscious mind does not care what it is you're doing. It, it really doesn't. Okay. Now, you ha I think you have a large one of the, the mood regulation. All right. So, let's look at this. If there are no ongoing nutritional, hormonal, and or need deficiency problems, you've removed the old Axis 3 issues and the Axis 4 issues. You've taken care of that. You can expect to have a relatively positive mood, a stable mood. Uh, what, and, and that means you're not vulnerable to a breakdown. And that's a really good way to be. And a good deal of the time, you will have a more positive feeling, you know, mood state, as, a pro, as opposed to a negative one or depression. Uh, now, if we have, you know, if you have chronic emotion management problems, boundary setting problems, you're probably not going to be able to get those things in place, and that can be a problem. That's why therapy or psychoeducation, you know, it doesn't have to be therapy, but you have to learn to manage the emotions in an adaptive way and also to set boundaries. That's to say no to people uh, in an effective way and also say no to yourself. All right. Uh, I just point out here, interest excitement uh, is a positive emotion that can help us achieve goals, including the removal of need deficiencies. And, uh, uh, you know, so if you're in an interested, excited state, you're doing something, you know, you're, you're engaged in something, while you're in that state, you're not likely to be feeling any kind of depression. If interest, excitement, emotion, sometimes it's called by some people, it's referred to as the seeking system, you know, it's what, you know, uh, uh, we use or uh, uh, mammals use, or, you know, to basically get our needs taken care of. You have a goal, uh, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a predatory cat, you know, 
or one that's not so present, most of them are, uh, you notice how they get when they are going after the prey. They're very focused and the interest, excitement, emotion is pretty strong. Um, okay. Uh, all right. I, and I put hypomanic and manic states are fueled by interest, excitement. So, you know, bipolar disorder, as they say, as they call it today, uh, usually means that uh, somebody is getting hypomanic or manic. And hypomanic is kind of the opposite of being depressed. You know, you've got great self esteem because interest, excitement makes you see things in a very positive way. And if you're thinking about yourself, you seem really good. Yeah, I'm great. I'm wonderful. You know, Donald Trump has a lot of interest excitement. He really does. You know, he, he's, and, uh, uh, so you know that's what happens when you're in an interest. If you take stimulating drugs like take amphetamine or cocaine, when people use those kind of stimulating drugs and they think about themselves, they usually feel they're pretty good. You know, they they like themselves a lot, and a lot of things look good. So that's interest, excitement, emotion. But interest, excitement, emotion tends to take away sadness, shame, and anxiety, a lot of the negative emotions. And so uh, people who are bipolar tend to shift back and forth periodically. Uh, but I think that it's important to note the difference between a hypomanic and a manic state. And, 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 you know, again, it's kind of glossed over, even though it's there. If you are manic, traditionally, that meant you were, you know, there was a good risk you were going to go psychotic. You are going to lose touch with reality. Uh, and with hypomanic, that, that's not there. So, again, we could say somebody like Donald Trump, perhaps, you know, he keeps reporting that he can get by on just a few hours sleep a night. He's got great energy. Uh, you know, people comment on that, and you can kind of see uh, uh, he has some of those features. So, uh, you know, that's a lot of people have that kind of a temperament, and uh, it can, in some cases, work well. But they are fueled by interest, excitement. Okay, and there you've got a big blow up of this. This is the interest, excitement diagram, just quickly. Goals, novelty, drives at the top. That's what triggers off the emotion. Uh, and you notice in the drives we have hunger, thirst, sex, affection, intimacy, and all the acquired addictions. You know, the, the, uh, and so what happens is the object that you're looking at or thinking about is all good, all important, all necessary. Seems really great. And uh, you have a disregard for ne negative consequences. Because if it prevails, it takes away shame and anxiety. Those emotions hurt. But that's what gives us an attachment to consequences in the real world. And we need it. Um, okay. All right, and I'm not, you know, you can uh, look at this, um, you know, and, and <coughs> obviously with, I just say again, with the addictions which a lot of people come into in order to anesthetize chronic emotional pain, uh, interest excitement when you have already got an addiction, which is now like a drive state, you know, you're going to feel a real physiological balance in your body when you don't have the drug. Um, and what happens is, you know, usually at first the drug you're taking seems all good, it's great, I love it. But then after a while it kind of, you know, shifts to uh, it's necessary, I gotta have it. You know, I, I must have it, just like food. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, I did, uh, I did a presentation here and I've done it a number of places called The Three Building Blocks of Mental Health which I'm kind of integrating into this. Uh, it's posted up on the you know, college website about a year and a half ago. Uh, and you know, this is, uh, for each emotion, you've got to be able to essentially take a time out. You have to say to yourself, you know, um, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and uh, this gives you, you know, uh, you want to recalibrate the automatic thoughts. So for example, 
if I'm thinking about I'm going to do a lot of drinking tonight and I'm going to drive a car, you know, later, um, you know, if I'm in an interested, excited state, I'm not, you know, I'm going to be telling myself I don't need to worry about it, it's no big deal, and, uh, you know, I might have a problem. But I need to be able to step back, say to myself, you know what, maybe I don't need to go drinking and driving. Or maybe I don't need to watch that television show that I've been waiting all week to watch. Uh, maybe there's other things that I really need to attend to and, and get done. Now, if you want to be able to take an interest excitement timeout or an anger timeout, a shame timeout, you have to rehearse and practice. A rehearsal, sometimes called mentalizing, is when you visualize actually doing it. You know, I've been waiting all week for the basketball game or the hockey game or whatever, you know, and I, I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, uh, but now I'm going to tell myself, you know, um, I think I'm not going to watch it and I can see myself doing it. Just simply making a decision, I'm not going to do it. And what I will find is, when I don't watch the game, uh, it's not going to have been as important, as necessary, or as good as I imagined it to be when I was in that interest excitement state. If you don't rehearse and practice emotion management, you will not be able to implement it in real time very well because the emotions are uh, very instinctual. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go with major depressive disorder. This is the real uh, disorder. Um, I brought a, uh, just to, uh, just down for a second, okay. Uh, this is DSM-5, uh, which contains, you know, the current bunch of disorders. There's lots of them. And I remind you of the prevalence. The prevalence <coughs> is, from uh, depressive disorder, major depressive disorder, uh, you know, pretty much half of the people in the country uh, are going to have one at some point in their life, and they're going to probably have more than one. And when you think about these prevalence, these lifetime prevalence uh, figures, and you can anxiety disorder is very, very similar. What does it mean? It means that you have a potential huge population of people who could potentially be given uh, uh, the psychiatric drugs. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry understands that quite well. And therefore, you know, they keep pushing to expand the market. This DSM is one way they do it. They keep increasing the disorders and lowering the threshold for being diagnosed. And they're also looking to, you know, now have mandatory testing for school children to see if they might come down with a depression or maybe their uh, psychosis at some point. These are all ways to get people essentially medicated. And, and, and with medication, there is a very small group of people, most of whom might have a diagnosis in the schizophrenic spectrum uh, area, or they might be bipolar manic and they actually get psychotic frequently, or the very few people might actually get kind of depressed and psychotic. And, and you know, they don't, and it's not being caused by medical issues or something else. Now those people, you could argue, you know, probably should take medication. It may be the best thing that's available. Some people would have other ideas, but, uh, uh, but understand that that group of people is so small that the pharmaceutical industry could not possibly make the kind of profits they expect to make. They have to have the depression, the anxiety, uh, the mood instability, in order the tension deficit disorder, etc., in order to make the profits. And as far as they're concerned, you know, if everybody took medication, it'd be great. <laughs> you know? uh, all right, so let, let's look at how absurd in some ways this diagnosis is. Uh, and I know people will, you know, again, of course, disagree with me. When I do this in front of an audience, I haven't done this one before, but other uh, uh, presentations, and there's a psychiatrist in the audience, they get very upset. 
you know, because they don't like to hear it, and I understand that. Uh, all right, so this is the diagnosis. Five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning. One of the symptoms, at least one of the symptoms, is depressed mood <coughs> or loss of interest pleasure. Notice two weeks. Two weeks. I mean, you know, that's not a very long period of time. And before DSM-3, or maybe it was one of the revisions of DSM-3, nobody thought, you know, if you're feeling these uh, symptoms for two weeks, you ought to be given a psychiatric diagnosis and probably medicated for it. That, that's, and, but that's how the game is essentially played, two weeks. Okay, so what does that mean? That means, okay, you have depressed mood most of the day, as indicated by subjective report. I feel sad, I have low self-esteem, uh, you know, I'm tired, etc. Markedly diminished interest. That means you don't have that interest, excitement, emotion going. Um, nearly every day by subjective account or observation. Significant weight loss when not dieting or, or weight gain. Now that, you know, um, it's a lot of times when people get very depressed, they may stop eating for different reasons. Uh, insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. Now, significant weight loss and insomnia are generally considered to be signs that somebody may be uh, uh, feeling suicidal. And, I, and again, I will talk about suicide, or if I don't, ask me about it. But I want to point out insomnia. You know, if you think of insomnia, have you ever had uh, a period of time where you could hardly get any sleep? How do you feel? You know, you don't feel very good. You know, you might feel kind of, you know, some psychomotor retardation. I'm, I don't, I'm depleted of energy. Uh, you might be feeling, you, I can't concentrate or think very well because I'm really sleep deprived. Um, you know, and, and again, you may not feel much interest excitement because you're very, very tired out and energy depleted. Now, they don't do anything other than to list these things. And by the way, there's no tests. There's absolutely no biomarkers, no blood tests, no imaging that can show any of these disorders. This is it. I mean, this is it, the list. It's like a checklist. Now, if you have bad insomnia, um, you might not want to get diagnosed with major depressive disorder or any other disorder. You might want to, again, if you haven't already, um, check out if you have any medical conditions that might be contributing to it. Take into account what's going on in your life. Maybe you just suffered a very significant loss and, and you're having a lot of feelings that you, you know, it's hard for me to, to, to go on without the person or, or whatever happened. And it's interfering with your sleep. Maybe your uh, primary care physician could give you something to temporarily help you sleep and uh, you might want to get some counseling, some therapy or talk to a friend, uh, you know, a, a pastor and, and, you know, get some assistance with it. So there it is. That's it. And and it's you know and you remember that little cartoon at the beginning. You know I'm feeling depressed. All right, I diagnose you with depression, and now I can give you medication. That's it. Um, and uh, you know they have these exclusionary specifiers. Uh, you know so if you're actually going to get diagnosed as schizophrenic because you're having. Uh, maybe auditory hallucinations or you're delusional, some combination of that, um, then they're going to, I guess, um, you know, you should be depressed for various reasons with, those, uh, with that kind of a problem. Um, and again, they say it's, it's not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. But they do not consider seriously uh, any nutritional deficiencies. That isn't uh, really on their menu. And if it was on their menu, they would be slowly probably putting themselves out of a lot of business. And, and, and that's why it's, it's, it's just not done. Informed consent means that you as a potential client 
or a consumer. When you go in to get some kind of mental health assistance, if you do, uh, you need to have these things explained to you and to insist that, you know, I don't really want, and again, unless you're breaking down, you know, you want to say, I don't want to take any medication until I, you know, maybe have some blood work done and, and get some things checked out. Okay. All right. These are, you know, emotional drivers of symptoms when medical conditions are factored out. You've had yourself checked out. You don't have those uh, medical problems. So, um, you know, you can, I mean, symptom one, and we're, we're going to go over the emotions quickly. Anyway, you can look at this. All of the symptoms are, re, you know, connected with uh, various emotional energies. Okay, I'm going to cut. All right, now we're going to look at a few theories. I've already gone over this one in a lot of ways already. Biomedical theories, that's it. You know, there you go. Uh, if you have the right neurotransmitters in your brain, you know, they're flowing the right way or there's the right amount of them, uh, good, you're normal. Then if you don't, you get depression, and then when you get your treatment, which is medication, antidepressant medications, uh, then you're fine. And I would say another thing, if you do choose, and I, I don't have any problem with somebody taking an antidepressant medication if you want to take it. It might make you feel better, uh, you know, for, but consider a couple of things. Uh, these medications have different half-lives. The half-life of a medication is when 50% of the drug is out of your system. So if you were given, let's say, Prozac, you know, the original SSRI antidepressant, that has a very long half-life. Sometimes, you know, it might be, the, there's some variables that affect it, but it might be, say, 10 days or so. That's a pretty good half-life. So if you forget to take your medication for a few days, you go on a little trip, you forget to take it along, uh, you're still going to be okay, because you won't start feeling the withdrawal until you get past the half-life point. On the other hand, uh, I, you know, a drug like Zoloft or Paxil or Effexor, which is similar, they have very short half-lives. You know, maybe a day, day and a half or so, two days. That's a whole different story, you know, because you don't have a lot of time to, to play around and not take your medication. And any of these medications you take, if you're the average person, if you take it long enough, uh, you will become dependent on it. You know, you, you can't just stop at 100%. Otherwise, you're really going to feel a withdrawal kind of a breakdown. You have to taper off of it very carefully and slowly. Okay. So, again, you know, this just outlines um, the biomedical theory which still is the dominant theory. We also have skill deficit theories. You know, and, uh, you know, there's uh, you know trying to make the decision. You know, leave it up, put it down. Uh, uh, you know, does the per you know does the person understand what the expected behavior is supposed to be or not? Uh, anyway, depression arises because the individual lacks skill sets necessary for the achievement of goals and the satisfaction of material and interpersonal needs. So you go back to those need areas. You really have to do everything you can to make sure you've got financial stability, good emotional support system, uh, community involvement, and you are actively engaged in individual development activities. You're increasing your knowledge and your skills. Uh, and, you know, skill deficit approaches de-emphasize psychiatric diagnoses and highlight need deficiency uh, problems. But again, uh, that's not what you're going to walk into generally. Okay, we have cognitive behavioral theories. <laughs> There's so many of these. They're just, uh, you know, it's hard to keep track of them. I remember when I was in training uh, at the Family Institute, and, you know, they always used to kind of joke around about, uh, well, we have 400 different systems of psychotherapy. And I remember 400, and by the way, they're all equally good. They all work. 
say, you know, and, and again, you take it in, and, and they give you a reason for it because actually the real important thing about therapy is, is that you have a good relationship with your therapist, and the therapist essentially becomes uh, a non-judgmental emotional support person, and that can be nice. Uh, but, you know, the idea that you've got, you, you know, 400 different uh, approaches. And with cognitive behavioral, you know, there's a lot of versions of it. Uh, you know, there's the original, there's uh, dialectical behavioral uh, uh, therapy, uh, and, and many, many. But they basically assert that psychopathology results from maladaptive attributions and appraisals concerning the self, the environment, and the future. Uh, you know, so uh, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors interact to produce maladaptive decisions and beliefs concerning the self, the environment, and the future. And, uh, you know, depression is marked by beliefs and ruminations centering around personal inadequacy and a hopeless future. Okay, this is pretty important in a lot of ways. Um, Beliefs, decisions constitute symptom maintenance factors. So when a decision is made or a belief is formed, consciousness is altered in the following ways. Consciousness is granted easy access to information that supports the decision or belief. If I believe that I am essentially an inferior person in this world, you know, it's going to be really easy for me to think of all sorts of reasons why I am that way. Um, consciousness is denied easy access to information that contravenes, goes against the decision or belief. I'm not going to be able to think of too many good reasons why I'm not an inferior human being. If information that contravenes, goes against the decision or belief, enters consciousness, it is usually rejected via, via rationalization or minimization. So, um, you know, if, if uh, uh, you know, you, somebody who's a good example really to uh, uh, understand this is, say somebody is psychotic, and I've had, uh, actually over time, I've had a few clients who had the belief that uh, their food was being poisoned uh, generally uh, by the family and you know uh, so they believe that their food was being poisoned and if you propose to the person you know as a thought experiment uh, or, or for you you say uh, let's get your food checked out you know bring in some samples we'll take it to a laboratory and let's see what happens so hypothetically let's say you check 12 samples of food and they all come back clean, and then you say to the person, look, uh, it, it really seems very unlikely that it's happening. And I kind of know your family, and I, I suspect they're not really doing this. But what do you think the person is going to say? They're going to say, they're going to minimize it. They'll say, well, that, that was only 12 samples of food. That's not enough. It's not enough. Or they will rationalize it away. They'll say, you know, I don't know whether that laboratory is any good, or maybe my family is in cahoots with the laboratory. <laughs> so it's very, very hard. Uh, that, that's why these delusions that people get are very, very hard to let go of. You actually have to rehearse and practice letting go, letting go sometimes of a belief that you may have. Uh, because it's getting you a lot of difficulty and you know, it's kind of maladaptive. Um, and that happens a lot. Um, now, emotionally driven belief, number five, decisions contribute to the suicidality, addiction problems, and lack of motivation that characterizes depression. As I usually say, uh, you know, the common depressive belief that's really a problem is when the person has the belief that they absolutely have no future. You know, their future is hopeless, there's nothing for them in life. That's a real, you know, that's a belief that has a lot of implications and a lot of further beliefs and decisions can spin off of that fundamental belief, which is emotionally driven. It's a sadness-driven belief. 
Now, beliefs can be imprinted via group pressure, social influence. You know, and again, to go to uh, uh, Donald Trump. So, you know, he's somebody who has uh, a lot of beliefs, like everybody else. You know, he has his beliefs. Uh, and, you know, uh, they have been given, a lot of them have been given to him by people that he associates with what he's been exposed to in his life, and uh, he's not likely to let them go very, very easily. Uh, and it's true for everybody. So when Donald Trump says, you know, uh, I do not believe that, uh, you know, climate change is occurring or it's problematic, that's what he believes. <laughs> you know, and hopefully he'll be able to let that go because it might be a problem. Um, I wouldn't bet on it. And uh, number, you know, and so again, when I say in number seven, beliefs can be imprinted via ruminations while the mind brain is in the social cognition default mode. That is the mode that you go to when your mind is not focused on solving problems. You go to what's called social cognition. You start thinking about your relationships in the past, in the future, and in the present. And if you're, you know, so in the, over the holidays, if you're spending time alone and you're not able to distract yourself adequately, you're going to start ruminating about your relationships from the past, in the present, in the future. You might start, you know, comparing yourself to other people, uh, uh, thinking about uh, injustices that have been done to you in the past, yeah. and so on. And, and that's not a good way to be, uh, again, in the holiday, and so you don't want to isolate spend time alone by yourself during the holidays. And there, again, you can kind of look at it. It's, uh, uh, it's you know, it's the way, uh, and by the way, when they uh, check this out, you can see certain areas of the brain turn on when you're problem solving. I'm giving this presentation, uh, hopefully a lot of people are paying attention to it. Uh, while you're doing that, you know, you're in a certain kind of mode. But when you switch off the task mode uh, or focusing on something, you're going to slip into this social cognition mode and you're going to probably start thinking about interpersonal relationships, things attached to that. Okay, and I just added this in here, you know, there's, in cognitive behavioral therapy, they have a whole list, you know, I, I, there may be 20 of them, of, you know, cognitive distortions. And if you actually look at them and you use uh, the emotional uh, information that I'm giving you, you can pretty much boil them down. You know, so for example, catastrophizing is an automatic instinctual thought driven by anxiety. You know, when you're anxious, you're always going to think the threat is going to be a catastrophe. It's going to be a nightmare. That's normal. Uh, and you're going to feel like maybe you can't handle it unless you actually know you can. Uh, and you can check the others. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go quickly to some depression and emotion management. Uh, if emotions are not managed in an adaptive fashion, unnecessary new stressors will emerge and the remediation of need deficiencies will not occur. So I go back to the beginning. Uh, you must make sure that you have your needs taken care of. Uh, if you don't, you're going to get emotional pain. You can't be surprised by it. And if you can't get things taken care of for a while, then you need to manage the emotions so that you do not create new problems or have a breakdown. When people came to see me in therapy, I'm not doing therapy anymore, but when they would come to see me, uh, I would always say, you know, that my goal here doing therapy with me is to have you be stable meaning you're not going to have any breakdowns and you know how to take care of uh, strong emotional energies when they come up and you know how to set boundaries with people effectively. Okay, you've got a big, you know, uh, slide of this. This is sadness. Uh, it's the, you know, two emotions are the heart of depression, I guess. Sadness and shame. And uh, sadness is the emotion we have which urges acceptance of a permanent loss. If somebody dies, that's a permanent loss. And sadness is really good for a permanent loss. There's a lot of other losses that could be conceived of as permanent. 
it gives us hopelessness and helplessness thoughts to help us accept the permanent loss. You know, if somebody dies, I cannot bring them back to life, I cannot resurrect them, it's hopeless, and I'm helpless to do so. And after a period of pain, because, you know, I don't have the person uh, in grief, I have to now let it go, because there's, if I keep obsessing about it for a, a, a long time, I don't have energy for losses that may be temporary or goals I'd like to accomplish. Emotional energy is finite. Okay, and um, this, again, is the kind of the standard. Uh, all right, so pretty much covers what I said. And, uh, you know, the sadness, time out. Um, oops, let me go back to that. All right, with a sadness, time out, it's like an interest, excitement, time out, or any other time out. You have to take some time and, man you know, and manage the emotion. Rehearsal and practice are necessary. For example, you go into the holidays. You might start thinking about loved ones who have passed on. That's, you know, kind of common. And you know that. You know, that's something you already know. That's what happens to me. I get depressed during the holidays because it makes me think of uh, the loved ones that I've lost. Well, okay, so rehearse. Imagine scenarios when you're there in the holidays. And, you, you know, maybe you're thinking of one of these loved ones. Go ahead, have a little grief about it. It's okay to cry, to feel some pain because you miss that person. But at the same time, remind yourself this is a permanent loss. And uh, uh, you have, and ultimately we either accept it or if we don't, we're going to be having a lot of unnecessary problems. And so you see yourself going through what it is you would like to go through. If you rehearse that in your mind when the time comes, you're probably going to be able to pull it off and that's a really good thing. You can't manage sadness, anxiety, shame, anger, any of it without the rehearsal and the practice. By rehearsal I mean mentalizing in your mind and practices, you do it in real time. Okay, here I am and this is what I'm going to do, just what I've been imagining. Okay. All right, so we, we have a, you know, a loss could be an attachment object. I was just talking, okay, all right. Um, regrettably, we're having a time problem. There's a lot here. A actually, uh, you can kind of look at this. I also put, there's a slide here on loss of freedom. I would say uh, uh, this is, you know, this is very common. Uh, often, uh, down, uh, you know, the learned helplessness and submissive behaviors that often manifest in tyrannical environments are sometimes viewed as adaptive in terms of ultimate survival. In other words, you know, if you're living in a slave society and you happen to be a slave, or you're living in a caste society and you're down there in the lower caste, you know, the untouchables, something like that, you know, it's probably pretty adaptive for you to be kind of sad and accepting of the fact that there's not a lot you can do because the environment may change at some time and then things could get a lot better. If you try to overthrow the uh, people who are keeping you down, you may just simply lose your life. Uh, and, and that's um, okay. loss of status. By the way, Tim, how much time do I have? Maybe five. Let, let's try to get within about five, wrap it up at five minutes. Okay. So questions. All right. Um, okay, so then we have loss of status, a pretty important one. Uh, uh, I put down here, and I did this for all the emotions, sadness generated beliefs. You know, I have no future. No one cares about me. I'm ineffectual and powerless. I'm going to commit suicide. Uh, we have shame. Uh, this is a really important one. Uh, this, what I'm giving you here as a handout is, is pretty clear about what you have to do with shame. We feel shame when uh, we get disrespected or we fail to meet some internal standard we have. And uh, on the disrespect side, uh, we have to set boundaries. Now, again, going to Donald Trump, um, you know, in that first debate with Hillary, Hillary Clinton and her team understood how Donald Trump was. 
And they knew that um, um, Okay, so um, they knew that Donald Trump, if he got disrespected, would probably manage the shame in a maladaptive way. Now, the maladaptive shame wants you to hide. It's an urge to hide. And, and we have, you know, three maladaptive ways of hiding. One is anger. You know, you insult me, I'll throw five insults back at you, take the spotlight off myself, shine it on you. Or I'll just be dishonest. Uh, I'll lie or, or distort something in, in a certain way. That's a way of hiding. It's maladaptive. Or you can just withdraw. So in the debate, um, you know, Hillary went ahead and I think she made some remark about, you know, the only reason, or she implied the only reason he was successful was because of his father's money. Now she knew that he might react with either anger or dishonesty, and he did react. <laughs> he got pretty upset uh, and didn't look good. And then, uh, you know, she said some other things, you know, Donald, you said this, Donald, you said that. And he just went ahead and said, no, I didn't. You know, in other words, and everybody pretty much knew he had. So he acted very instinctively to uh, her disrespect of him in that, you know, very uh, public context. He didn't know. But, of course, and, you know, I remember after the first debate, Hillary said, uh, one down and two to go. And she figured, you know, this is going to be really easy. But, of course, he got coached, and uh, on some level it was explained to him that you can't react in that way, even though it's, you know, the way you feel. And she already knew that. And when, of course, he, she would get insulted, being a longtime lawyer and politician, etc., <laughs> she knew what to do. we got to just move on. All right, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, let me just run through this. Um, yeah, there, well, there's a lot here, and, and you know, more time is needed. Uh, but you know, I give you all of this because it's a kind of complete psychoeducation handout. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, maybe we can get to some of these other things. So I'll, I'll just conclude it. Right. Um, if there's a way, if there's a way that you can get me the handout, I, or or a section of it, I'll make sure we can get it posted. On the a link to it on the YouTube page, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. so that people can look at it because yeah. I know it's not going to come up in the video too much. But that, that's right. We'll 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 make sure it gets posted. Paul here. And we'll... Okay. Okay. Uh, let's now proceed to questions and answers. Thank our speaker. Thank you. And Andy, if you're ready to moderate questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, you talked about Donald Trump briefly. And uh, I'd like to ask, are you uh, suggesting that Donald Trump is a drug case? Uh, did, did you say drug case? Right. No, no, not at all. I mean, I'm sure he's not, if, if what, you know, the way he's, his reputation is. I'm saying that he has a lot of features that people would associate with uh, hypomania. You know, he talks about the fact that he doesn't need much sleep. He's got a very active mind. He enjoys being with people, you know, uh, doing the rallies, and he has a lot of energy. Now, you know, that's not necessarily a bad way to be if you can, you know, manage it well. You can be very, very productive. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Let's just take these guys first. Uh, okay, you go to your doctor. You say, I'm a little depressed. And the doctor says, well, why don't you keep busy? Why don't you get some exercise? And how about a vacation? What's wrong with those? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you think about it again, it, you know, uh, there's a whole uh, kind of type of uh, therapy called behavioral activation. That just means you're feeling depressed. You know, get up every day, do some tasks. Take out the garbage, wash the dishes, clean something up, and so on. And, uh, you know, then you'll get the interest, excitement, emotion going, and you're going to feel a lot better. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, but, again, you want to be sure 
Because if the doctor tells you that, okay, uh, exercise and get out more, you know, go take a vacation. But let's say you have nutritional medical problems. That's not going to do you, that's not going to help that. Uh, uh, if you have need deficiencies, you have very poor emotional support, or you, you know, lack community involvement, you're, you know, have financial issues, uh, then that probably isn't going to be sufficient. Those have to be attended to. And if you don't know how to manage an emotion, like anger, for example, if every time you get angry, you start insulting people, threatening them, uh, attacking them, you know, how do you get your needs taken care of in the real world? It's very hard. And that would have to, you'd have to learn to manage that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, what examples of micronutrients do you believe that uh, most of what, that Americans could be missing? Well, the ones that are usually cited in terms of depression. Now, again, when you see, if you go to Mad in America, look at that webinar, which will be, it's really good. Uh, you're going to be told you need all of them, okay, all of them. The ones that are particularly cited for depression are usually a vitamin D deficiency, which is actually a hormone, uh, omega-3, you know, fatty acid deficiency, uh, a magnesium deficiency, uh, vitamin B deficiency, particularly vitamin B12. Okay, those are ones that are very, you know, uh, cited. Okay, who's got a, all right. Yeah. Raj, right there. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, along that same line, um, could, I know I looked real quick, and there, there must be like dozens of different types of multivitamins, and you had said earlier about taking a multivitamin. Yes. Okay, I, and then my second question would be, um, I, like my father passed away almost a year ago, but I still see him like regularly in a dream, even like last night, and, and, it, and it's hard for me to, I don't know why it keeps happening. Well, okay, so as far as the multiple vitamin part of your question, uh, when you see that, they, they recommend a certain type that they used in the research, uh, and, and it's fairly, uh, it's got a pretty good dosage of every vitamin that's there. You might want to purchase what they're recommending. Or just get a multiple vitamin uh, uh, and, you know, take it every single day. Now, uh, concerning, you know, your father coming up in a dream. Well, now, if you had a good relationship with your father, you know, somebody you were attached to and you miss, you have to understand it kind of in that context. You know, uh, uh, that's, you know, and, and if you are currently missing something that maybe your father represents, uh, it, it could be understood in that way. And, but of course, the way that you yourself understand it, I'm not asking you that here, is, is of significance. You know, what it means to you, what it represents to you. It's a very personal kind of thing. Okay. I have a question. Tim, you're going to handle the question. Uh, Andy's okay. here, and oh. he'll take care of it. Oh, go ahead. Great. Okay. Tim, I have a question. Well, let, let him go first. Go ahead. My question to you is this. In terms of a little louder, please. In terms of um, relieving stress and so on, what role do non-human animals, pets, cats and dogs, and so on, play in all this? Well, they're really good because uh, you, you know if you think about it, uh, a cat or a dog, and some people love cats, others prefer dogs, but they will give you emotional support you know, as best that they can, and sometimes it's really good. And you don't have to worry about the dog generally uh, being disrespectful to you. The cat sometimes <laughs> might get that way. Loud, please. Louder. Speak up. Can I have a question? Why don't you enter the mic? So I'm kind of in, I'm in holistic medicine. My question to you, uh, what do you think uh, holistically and demiatically possibility to uh, treat depression uh, without uh, any strong communication? Okay, so you know that question about holistic uh, medicine and uh, you know it's 
I'm yeah. sorry? Homeopathic? Homeopathic. Homeopathic. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's something that could be very, very helpful. Now, uh, uh, you know, again, what you have to think about with depression and really any other mental health issue or diagnosis, everything that I'm laying out for you here needs to be considered. Not just one thing. Otherwise, you know, you may have a lot of problems and you may think, you know, for example, sometimes people would come to therapy and, you know, they would get pretty much, they liked the therapy, they assimilated what I was trying to teach and, and so on, but they had uh, other kinds of problems like nutritional problems, uh, et cetera, and, and it would still plague them. And, and I, found it pers I, I found it hard to lead people down the nutritional route. It was, it was a difficult thing. Over here. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned several times Donald Trump and his perceived problems, and then just before you ended your discussion, you mentioned how the Clinton campaign can play in the events and how she knew how to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Would you kindly explain why the hell he won? Well, again, I, I you know he won for many, uh, from my point of view for a lot of reasons that have been cited. Burnham. You know, I, I, the fundamental, you know, issue. Now, this is just my opinion, and I know a lot of you may disagree with it. Prejudice. However, <laughs> and this is a point, but I, I just think that, uh, you know, the American population in, in many, many areas of the country have essentially been relatively impoverished relative to how it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and therefore, he was talking that way, and so was Bernie Sanders, and in a normal, in a different time frame, neither one of those guys would have been a serious candidate. Okay. Charlie. Yeah, Dan, do you think children should be told, isn't it potentially harmful or anxiety creating, to be told that there's Santa Claus who will withhold <laughs> gifts from them? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I saw that. Uh. I saw that, uh, you, you know, uh, the thing, I mean, the thing is with, with, uh, with children, uh, you know, as you get older, there's a lot of things you've got to assimilate. I, I remember uh, speaking in terms of somebody, uh, when I was about three and a half or four years old, my great-grandmother passed away, and that was the first time I knew about somebody dying. And I was very young, and I asked my mother, you know, does everybody die or something like that? And she hit me with it. Yeah, you know, everybody dies. She told me, though, we'd, we'd go to heaven. But, uh, which, you know, didn't uh, register in a certain level with me, but I took it that way. And the same thing with, you know, with Santa Claus. Eventually, children are going to learn there's not a Santa Claus. Wait a minute. Uh, and uh, being told that, you know, could it lead to uh, uh, problems? Maybe in some cases, in other cases, I don't know. You know whether whether it would. I mean, you lied to your parents. Well, you know, the, unfortunately. I never trust them. All right, all right. All right. Well, okay. Unfortunately, there is going to be a lot of again lying. You know, that goes on uh, over here. Yeah. Can, can, uh, can uh, uh, the, the, the anti-psychotic medication, can that burn out, this psychologist told me it could burn out the mind and make you a zombie, long-term use. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, I do agree, because, be, you know, because with, with anti-psychotic medication, uh, you know, it, ha it creates, it, it's a drug. Think of it this way, you know, uh, alcohol has been around for a long time, and everybody who, you know, is, is uh, uh, encountered somebody who's used alcohol for a long period of time, knows, you know, heavy usage every day, knows that that person's probably going to come down with a lot of medical problems, including having their uh, brain damaged by uh, the alcohol. And it's the same thing with the antipsychotic medications. What those medications do, they, they basically block the flow of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter that gives you the interest, excitement, emotion, and uh, it does some other things, but it, it basically blocks it off. 
and uh, uh, it, it tends to lead to uh, different kinds of problems. People develop movement disorders, they're called dyskinesias. Tardive dyskinesia means it comes on a little bit later and it can be permanent, you know, your face can twitch, other parts of your body. Uh, there's other kinds of things that people come down with from these medications. And the thing is, which, which is unfortunate, people are told, uh, you know, they start to notice they don't feel very good a lot of times on the antipsychotic medication. And they stop the medication. If you stop one of those antipsychotic medications when you've been on it for a period of time, you're going to have, a, for the average person, a really serious breakdown. And, and then they're going to, and then what they used to do blatantly is tell the person, you see how sick you are and you just never should go off your medication. They did not discuss and they had no interest really in doing so that, you know, you have to taper off of it very, very slowly. Generally no more than 10, 15 percent, 20 percent of the time. Over here, yes. Hi. Um, depression has been very widely diagnosed in my family. Cousins, three out of four of us in my immediate family. Do you believe there's a genetic component? Well, again, you know, we, we have to say, I guess, there's a genetic component for everything. There's a genetic component. Some people are more prone to come down with diabetes or cancer and, and all sorts of things. But having a genetic component or a vulnerability doesn't mean that it's going to manifest. And again, what I've given you here is a number of things that you have to look out for. They all have to be covered. And if you look at your family members, you might find that there were some emotion management problems. There may have been uh, some nutritional difficulties, some other medical issues. Uh, uh, they may have been in very, very unfortunate circumstances. A, a lot of different things. And, and uh, those all, everything has to be addressed. If you don't address it all, you know, a lot of your effort may just come to uh, a disappointing, you know, conclusion. Okay. One more question, then we'll go to rebuttal. Right. Uh, Raj, what, I see lots of people who do not have resources to, yes, to, I mean, go through what you described. And lots of people do not have interpersonal skill to deal with a, that issue because they cannot talk to other people very easily for their problem. So what, what they do? Well, again, uh, let, let's, you know, uh, interpersonal skills can be learned. They can be learned. They abs anybody can learn them. But they have to be, as I say, rehearsed and practiced in order to uh, be able to implement them in, in the real world. Uh, if somebody is living in poverty, which a lot of people do, or near poverty, uh, you have to be very, very careful uh, to do things like budget. Tr you can try to improve the situation. Uh, I, I under, you know, if, if you look around, um, and again, working in community mental health like I did for so long, I was encountering people constantly that, you know, had financial instability. And uh, yet, uh, uh, what can you do? You can manage the emotions while you're in that state and try to get the skills and uh, try to improve the situation or try to manage in the current circumstances. Now a lot of times, and I didn't get to go into it, but it's in there, we have to set boundaries with people. So for example, in a lot of uh, neighborhoods, in a lot of situations, people are very disrespectful. And uh, we have to be able to limit disrespect. You know, if somebody calls somebody, you know, you're a loser, uh, you know, you're, you're an idiot, uh, you know, you're a punk, you're this or that, you hear this stuff all over the place. Those disrespectful comments attacking somebody's identity need to be put a stop to, you know, and people have to learn to be able to say, you know what, uh, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way about me, uh, but I really appreciate it if you not go there again. And people have to be taught to do that, otherwise they have temper tantrums or they just stuff it. And, and that, that is something which is really important. 
Uh, and and uh, again, I didn't get to go into that, but uh, yeah. That's good. Well, let's have a good round of right. applause for our speaker tonight. Our speaker uh, demonstrated uh, how you do a superb job of trying to cram 100 pounds of potatoes into a 20 pound sack. Right? Exactly. <laughs> right. So, okay, uh, let's have a show of hands of who would like to give a rebuttal. I'm first. <laughs> Right, that's good. That's good. So this is number one over here. Like hold hold your early. hands up. Hold, everybody hold your hands up. Who's rebutting tonight? People walk on beer quarter nine tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Tim is five. Is that five people? There, that there, want to rebut? We'll allow for more. Charlie six. Okay. Make it about four minutes. We'll I think start. We'll start with four minutes oh, apiece. Really? The time is short. Um, okay. Could, okay. I, I don't have a timer yeah, in front of me. I got a timer. Okay. Okay. All right. Why don't we uh, put the mic in that little slot in the middle there? Stick it in here. Uh, then you can actually. Stick it in there. All right. I'll stick it in there. Now, those of you who know me, probably don't like me. Don't care. <laughs> don't care at all because. It's, Ain't gonna matter to me, and I ain't gonna pay my bills anyway. Delusions of grandeur disorder. Ah, uh, like I said, I don't care. <laughs> it don't matter. <laughs> what are you gonna do to me now? You know, I mean, it's already been done. I was already drafted <laughs> once. What did you threaten me with now? Uh. Now I heard this figure tonight, and it's wonderful. I didn't know I was going back to psychology 203, <laughs> but. Uh, it was informative, and I congratulate him. He actually can rest probably a semester's worth of information in an hour. <laughs> the students in the semester won't remember it, and most of the people here in the hour won't remember it when they leave. But it was interesting. Now we come to the election. Do we have to? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I guess you do. And it comes down to, we won, you lost, accept it. When it comes down to this point where the Greens, who got 1% of the vote across the country, are demanding recounts in states where if the Green Party hadn't been on the ballot, Hillary would have won, is ludicrous. $10 million for recounts. They didn't spend $10 million for their entire general election campaign, and suddenly in 15 days, they got $10 million to demand recounts in three states. It's not their money. <laughs> it's Democratic money being funneled through a third party, believe me, and it's not going to change the election. Wisconsin has already decided they're just going to go review the totals that they've already got from the precincts. They're not going to go count every ballot again. In Michigan, it took them three weeks to decide who won to begin with. They're not going to change their decision. I mean, that's it. In every state where Barack and Michelle Obama, the president and First Lady, respectively, campaigned for Hillary, she lost. Every one of them, well, they campaigned heavily for her. She might not have lost by much, but she lost. And a lot of southern states down there, and in Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, these states were considered dialed in and locked in by the Democrats to begin with, and they lost, every last one of them. Whether you like it or not, it says something. I'm not quite sure what it is yet, but it says something. By the way, if you're wondering about the hat, that's the National Restaurant Association. Not the National Rifle Association. Uh, I know it gets confusing because everybody thinks we're all gun nuts, but some of this 
Deuce actually worked for a living and install restaurant equipment. <laughs> and I did. It's hard to fathom this election because in the jump in the primary, I voted Democratic. I voted for Bernie Sanders. And then before the convention, the Democratic convention, he sold us out all to go down to Guyana, drink the Kool-Aid, and vote for Hillary. Didn't make a fight of it, he made a deal. I don't know what the deal was supposedly be, supposedly was, but he didn't win. He didn't win. So he ain't getting this deal. And the fact is, for the general election, she didn't win either. For four years we're stuck with what we've got. Thank you. Get used to it. <laughs> All right, Mr. Travis. Uh, there was some talk about... Uh, Loud. <laughs> there was some talk about believing in Santa Claus. Uh, but I, I came up with an interesting question a while back, and that is, is it okay for Jewish people to believe in Santa Claus? And uh, the <clears throat> answer that I came up with was that it is absolutely okay for Jewish people to believe in Santa Claus, uh, as long as they don't incorporate it into their religion. Uh, believing in Santa Claus, any common sense will tell you there's no man with a beard that slides down every chimney there is and puts Wait. presents under your Christmas tree. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can I uh, have some attention, please? Uh, but rather, the belief in Santa Claus is a belief in generosity, and it's a belief in the spirit of giving. And uh, in view of the fact that nowadays Jewish people give Hanukkah presents to one another, uh, one might almost say that it's okay for Jewish people to believe in Santa Claus because that it's the spirit of giving that they're believing in, the same as Americans believe in Uncle Sam. <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, Uncle Sam, we know, is not a real man. He's the collective uh, uh, vision that we have of the United States. And so, in that sense, Santa Claus does exist. I then want to say, Thank you. I then want to say that with respect to uh, people having uh, uh, depression, and uh, our speaker was nice enough to mention that when people are depressed, when they wait for a bus and the bus doesn't come and you get depressed, there's, there's a way to deal with that. And the way to deal with that is, is you get a gun and then when you wait for the bus and it doesn't come for a long time, you get on the bus, but you don't shoot anyone because those people are people just like you and me. Uh, but you shoot the bus driver because he's Boo. the son of a bitch that caused the bus to be late. Boo! Boo! Can you Boo. please shut up? Boo! Uh, Boo! <laughs> what's more, when people become depressed and think about committing suicide, it would be better if they did commit suicide and uh, we got on with the business of reducing uh, the, the surplus of the human population. That's all. Tim, what? Okay, my Ball's fixing the microphone. Violent Green. And you thought I was good, He's getting the microphone reattached. Hey, we're good brothers, too. We got it. That cognitive distortion. Serious. Oh, yeah, Roger. My name is for myself. I think sometimes disgusting is what we do. And uh, I'm from one. Uh, those who are getting email, I'm going to come back. Hello, hello out there in the college. Uh, could we have some quiet to let, let our speaker uh, give his four minute rebuttal? You guys, please keep it down. 
Thank you. Start over again. We'll just pick up where you left off. Okay. Uh, sometimes dis disgusting people win too, but that's fine. But next uh, week, uh, those who are getting my emails, I'll be writing about uh, how Trump can succeed, and probably he will succeed. Okay, but let's come to the current thing. I mean, mental mental illness is a problem. There are two reasons it is so big. One is that love, love is lost within family, within friends. There is no love, and uh, love can uh, love and uh, support and working together can solve lots of problems in this society. But looks like I'm further and further away. We are getting away. And people are lonely. People are lonely in a tremendous way, at an odd level. Senior citizens, ordinary people, married people, young people, everybody is lonely. Thanks, thanks. You know, even when they are living with somebody, even when they are married, you know, the guy sleeping with his dog and a woman is just sleeping with her, her cat. You know, and this is a problem. And we, we, it's not going to go away easily. Second, second problem is that that uh, this uh, industry, what pharmaceutical industry as well as psychologists, psychologists and psychiatrists, whatever you call them, they have a separate problem, and just for sake of making money or whatever, sometimes you say that is right. But you know, there are there are not lots of solutions. I mean, I have, I had this young man get a PhD. <coughs> And the doctor convinced him that uh, if he can, he should keep his stress low, like working for a job, he should take a less stressful job because stress will hurt him. And he was taking example. I couldn't convince him otherwise because uh, the therapist told him that that's the way it is. And he was taking medic medication. And uh, I, I have seen in my own life when I talk to people, and I have talked talk to lots of people, sometimes. Do you know, a little chat with a stranger, you five, spending five, ten minutes asking questions about how they are doing, you know, what is their education, what are their job plans, it makes them feel good. And I think we all will spend little time to talking to people, other people and say, hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know? The one thing I you know about dog and about dog you are right. And I have I have two parakeets. And two parakeets have changed my life. We, we watch videos together. I mean, they line up behind me, and they sometimes request it. And we have a good time. You know, we, we sometimes fight. We have annoyances, and we, we love. But I, I can believe it that we paracadet, we can communicate so much. But it works. And I think everybody should have a pet. And I have never, never one of the mainly crusted, he's a dog. I love him. Dog is so loyal to him. He can get enough of him. So there are a million ways to do it without therapy. Thank you. And I think psychologists and other people, they should be stressing this. Hey, buy a couple of parakeets. What in the heck, you know? You before you take medication. It might work. Thank you. I have a rather fundamental question for our speaker tonight. Why? Aren't you on a talk show? <laughs> Why aren't you on like the radio as a guest speaker? Yeah. Because the material you gave tonight was, I consider, very high quality, and you could probably hold your own with some of the people I've heard on WGN or National Public Radio or anybody else. Come on, don't you all agree? Absolutely. He said he's retired. I know he's retired, but that's usually when you can they are freed up from your job and you don't have worry about political ramifications of what you're talking about. And at the time you have a lifetime of a career behind you, and you can draw upon experience from patients and everything else. If there was one thing I hope you get out of tonight, and that is since this will be going live on YouTube, is to, I strongly encourage you to get into some kind of an organization or some place that you can start doing more public presentations of this thing. I know for me that, you know, as a kid, I was one of the first to be diagnosed with ADD and I had the Ritalin going on and 
everything else. And about the time I got into high school, my father said, you need to get go out and play football and get some exercise. And all of a sudden, I found myself tired. I found myself a little crazy, but I didn't have the attention deficit disorder. I mean, there's still a, a, some of it in there, and it still lingers to this day. But I've also known, too, that uh, you know, there was a lot of bullying in my own childhood, but a lot of that, too, was brought on by my own self and my own conduct. Yeah. And, you know, over, over the years, one of the best things I've done for self-medication, you know, is get involved in a community activity, whether it be a church or a group that I strongly suggest in Toastmasters, which can teach things. And I found over the years with myself uh, was that the best way to overcome social anxiety dis disorders or any of uh, things that you can't get along with is get out in a group in something you like and learn and volunteer. Or if you're having trouble at the workplace, you know, there's always ways to get a better job or try to make what you're doing a little bit more fun. I don't want to stay much longer than what I need to be up here except for the fact that I very much applaud your, your <coughs> s s teachings and your, well, <coughs> frankly, preachings tonight because what I heard tonight is a lot of what I hear at my church a lot of times, you know, just through the general beliefs and, and, and the various things and it. We all need a community to, to and, a, and a fellowship of people to, to rely on. So, and, and it's assuring to see that some of the things that I'm learning about in various other ways line up with this. So again, thank you for coming. We appreciate your teachings and your, and your leavings here at the college. And please, let's get you heard on the radio. Thank you very much to the speaker for an excellent presentation. Uh, I just want to read some of the things that we learned about this evening in this uh, great, great talk. We learned about anxiety disorders, mood disorders, psychotic disorders, dysfunctional behavior patterns, maladaptive behaviors, personality disorders, hormonal imbalance, inadequate community involvement, lack of individual development activities, level of functioning. Uh, you can make a really good case of all of the uh, don't forget elongated bloviating disorder. Elongated bloviating disorder. That should have been the first one. <laughs> <laughs> All, the All of these uh, could be argued are symptoms of foreign policy of the United States scorched earth quest for hegemony. Uh, imperialism, or as I like to call it, uh, in the era just before uh, Trump extinctionism. You know, we're supposed to learn as children to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then our foreign government, with our trust, our time, and our taxes, does the opposite. There's a book written by James Carroll, it's called House of War, and the subtitle is it, The Pentagon and the Disastrous Rise of American Power. I encourage everyone to read this book and to think about what it means to have someone with serious mental illness, or maybe that's an a insult to mental illnesses to say, to be in charge of the American Empire as President of the United States. And by the way, someone said earlier that he won. Yeah, he won because we have an archaic system called the Electoral College. He actually got less votes than the popular vote. Yeah, uh, a loser. 97 million people essentially voted either no confidence or none of, 
or uh, alternative. So uh, I don't know how that's winning in uh, the industrial world in the 21st century. Yeah, Joe. Uh, we all lost. We the people. We know that much. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, "Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force." And the uh, Charter of the United Nations, Article 1, Section 4 reads, All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Uh, what, what do you and your family and your community members need to know that we need a peaceful and democratic mass mobilization for a general strike to stop this inauguration from happening January 20th. I don't need any more proof that we the people uh, have the capacity to say no to madness with an out of control military. This is a quote by Slim Brundage to end this. I know what the good old USA is doing. We are teaching the world to hate us. We, with our expanding imperialism, we, with our countless global military outposts, ready to quell any democratic uprising which might be patterned after our American Revolution. In country after country, we have put the landlord back on the peasant's back. With all our guns and all our money, all we can do is make the people of the world hate us. Let's do something beautiful and make the people of the world love us and collectively say, especially with those 97 million Americans who said no to all of them, uh, that we're better than this because we know that we have a history that we shouldn't let be squandered and botched for a guy who has a button on the nuclear arsenal. All right. Charlie, you got a rebut? He's not having a cigarette. Go ahead, Andy, if you need to do a little rebuttal. I'll take four minutes. <laughs> well, one of the problems I've been wrestling with for the last uh, all 25, 30 years is how do you distinguish when, when somebody stands up at a podium or they, they give you an earnest uh, accounting of the facts, and their facts are, you know, they're so far out of touch with observable reality. Does that person have a mental illness, or are they flat out lying to you? How, how do you tell the difference between somebody that's delusional and somebody that's a slick, polished liar? Groups like this get infiltrated all the time by trolls and other people that just want to uh, throw a monkey wrench into the works every now and then to slow down the spread of knowledge. And that's what's happening around the country right now as spelled out by the new censored news book. Project Censored came out of the Sonoma State. It's published in October. The book was not available at Barnes & Noble until after the election. Hey, Tim, could, could you kind of sit down a minute? Um, Project Censored had a whole chapter in that book about the criminal negligence of our media. The media made a deal with the Clinton campaign to lie to us from day one about the vote count. So when Bernie Sanders was winning primaries, the next day the media came out and announced Hillary the winner. Number one, Bernie won by uh, a couple million votes or more nationwide, and the media flat out lied to us. So that was the first election theft. The second election theft was Trump losing in a whole bunch of places and red shifting the vote after we went to bed and the media coming out announcing him the winner. If you're going to live, you can live in the fantasy based world and keep arguing about how did Trump win? How did Trump win? That's like arguing about. The old saying, you know, um, when I was growing up, we used to see cases of a parent that would abuse a child. And he'd say, after beating the kid, he'd say, you know, look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. It's your fault. Well, I'm sick and tired of this bullshit. Trump is not the winner. Trump got less than 25% of the votes available in this country. The winner 
The winner was the American people that served up a giant middle finger in the form of Donald Trump to the establishment. That's how Trump got into office. And I thought George W. Bush was the greatest middle finger we served up to foreign leaders that had to call that idiot Mr. President for eight solid years. But it looks like Trump, Trump is going to surpass him. So if we're going to make any progress on climate change, bringing the troops home, stop the killing, um, we have to face the reality of the basic facts. We can't go on letting the media browbeat us into thinking, oh, well, Trump's the winner, so uh, sore losers get over it. This was the most corrupt election in the entire history of America. And it wasn't just Trump that they shipped to the votes for. It was a whole bunch of Republican criminals masquerading as senators and congressmen that had the vote shifted to keep those bastards in office. As I said before, our Congress, we can brag about it. Our Congress is the smoothest running, best financed intellectual whorehouse on the planet. <laughs> it's a whorehouse. And if we don't do something about it, scientists from NASA are telling us about Manhattan being under 40 feet of water by 2070. That's how fast the methane is melting under the sea, Russia, everywhere else. It's number one crisis. I'll close with this one thing. What's the number one story that should be on front page news all over the country? Global warming. How about 3,000 veterans coming from all over the country with more on the way to stand with the water protesters out in uh, Dakota? against the pipeline protests. There's veterans now risking their lives peacefully standing in front of police so that the police don't have carte blanche to kill these people with all kinds of uh, aggressive weapons and stuff. This is where we are in our country, and if we face the reality, we outnumber those people a thousand to one. But we have to be in the reality-based community rather than the fantasy-based community. Yeah. Thank you. My name, is, my name is Dan Weinberg, and that was Andy Anderson, and that was right. Hey, louder, louder, please. Use the mic. I am using the mic. Okay. Okay, take your time. All right, I'll take my time. So, so people who say, like Chris Hedges, who says that America is running out of oil and they're going crazy fracking and going to Iraq and stealing their oil and doing deals with Saudi Arabia and stealing their oil and giving them money. America is, America is ending its empire. And people like me and Andy and Chris Hedges, they're, they're just crazy people who, who have it all wrong. And America is great. And yay, America. And, well, you know, somebody has to say what is the truth. And if you don't want to hear it, if you think you just want to turn us off, you know, and go to the station that has happy news and smiley news, well, go ahead, turn the station. You know? But, you know, people like this guy, Dan Bader, this guy, this son of a gun, he, he comes here and he says, oh, you have a problem if you think America's wrong. If you have a problem if you think America is ending its empire and it's just going crazy, polluting every ocean, polluting all the land, it's your imagination. America's great. Look around. We got we got cars on the road. Look out the window. There are hundreds of cars. And the, the streets are fine. They're paved with gold. People have jobs. Well, that's half the story. And if you're crazy, then all that all those hundreds of cars are they're a mirage. They're not real. It's something fantasy. But you know what? All this all these cars are going to end pretty soon because all that gas and oil is going to end. And then everybody will be crazy, Dan. Everybody will be depressed. Everybody will have bipolar. Everybody. And there aren't enough psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers to, to, to solve all the problems. And insurance companies are not going to pay for it. 
because there won't be enough money and they won't give a shit. And all the people in the insurance companies, they'll be on vacation. I'm going to protest. And all the people are crazy. The they'll be stuck here CPS in the college the complexes. That's not news, Dan. All right. Yeah, this is what um, all right. I didn't get, I didn't hear the lecture tonight, as I'm sure probably a lot of people right. are aware. But if you paid your $3? Yeah, well, you know. Well, and you can't what, give a rebuttal if you yeah. haven't paid your $3. Yeah, well, well I just want to say that that, that has never, never stopped. That, that not missing a lecture has never stopped. I didn't say because you missed the lecture. I, yeah. I said because well, you didn't pay your uh, One fool at a time. Uh, one fool at a time, okay? No. Now, um, there's, um, I, I heard what Andy said about, um, Andy said Hillary won the election. That Hillary actually did get more of the popular vote than Trump by about two million or so. However, in the system, in the system we have, it is possible to to lose the popular vote and still win the election. This happened once. This happened before in 2000. Tilden. Yeah, because well, there's the Hayes Tilden election, and then there's also there's also the um, Abraham Lincoln only had well, well, of the time. yeah, hey. Uh, one fool at a time. I, one, I said one fool at a time. Did you no. hear me the first time around? No. Okay. I thought we were being nice today. Um, I think we are. Now, um, so, so yeah. So it is pot the problem. So the so the reason for this is the electoral college because the thing is it's not the people in the, the way the constitution is written. It's not the people that elect the president. It's the states and. The states, or, or really, it's the electors. In, in, in theory, the electors, you know, in a lot of, well, now there's a lot of state laws that require the electors to vote the way the popular vote went in their state. Uh, originally, the electors could vote any way they wanted to, and they would just, just only take the popular vote of their state under advisement. But, so, so ultimately, you know, yeah, it's, it doesn't it doesn't make any difference. So Hillary got more votes. So what? You know, they, they Trump, uh, you know, Trump won anyway because because of the way the system is, uh, some votes count for more than others. Uh, a vote from the state of Wyoming counts a heck of a lot more than a vote for president from the state of California. And um, and now you could say, well, what we need to do is abolish the Electoral College, and I've heard a lot of people saying that. That would require a constitutional amendment, uh, and given the fact that the system works very well for the Republicans, who control most of the state governments and both houses of Congress, um, the odds of getting a constitutional amendment like that passed are about zero. And I see that Tim is telling me to wrap it up, so, uh, so I will yield the floor to the next rebuttal speaker, whoever that is. Okay, Charlie, four minutes. All right. Somebody Last rebuttal. Oh, yeah. That's mine, Charlie. Oh. I'll get it, but thanks. All right, uh, let's thank our speaker for uh, these voluminous handouts and the time you put in on the PowerPoint presentation. I'll be eclectic as usual. Um, the uh, I spoke about holidays this time of year last year on the, the holidays that we celebrate in the United States and uh, certainly this uh, Christmas holiday um, is a little bit out of proportion. Uh, it's distorted beyond the other holidays by any by factor. Uh, several times. Um, there's a whole host of emotional, psychological factors that would become operative around this occasion. Um, there's all sorts of increased interactions among individuals, uh, exchanges, uh, and a whole host of expectations which come into play which aren't are, we don't see them during the rest of the year. Uh, the, the holiday, I believe, has appeal basically in terms of its materialism, since uh, 
stuff, materialism gives meaning to people's lives, as well as the fictitious busyness or a a increased activity seems to be interpreted as you are an important person because you're busy, perhaps not doing anything of any significance. Um, the other thing I'd like to add about the holidays, it does create from the psychological things, I've read that it causes disputes among newlywed couples in particular because each of them comes with different family traditions. And then there has to be a compromise the first year that they are married. And one thing I'd like to share with you, many, many years ago, I was going out with a young lady and we actually ended up giving each other, we gave ourselves several gifts, and this is not planned, but we gave each other identical gifts. <laughs> so I must say, we did have, I'm not making this up. It was like five gifts, and they were identical. <laughs> Someone that was there said, this isn't possible. This is, uh, anyhow, um, regarding Trump and this election, we have elected someone president in the United States who has a personality disorder. <laughs> the people who voted for him equally share in that personality disorder. Um, he has no adherence to the truth, has no problem telling absolute and total lies. If he's called in about any of these lies, he attacks the person uh, as, uh, as a defense mechanism, usually giving them some sort of name calling. Um, anyone in critical achieves the same degree of criticism. Um, one other thing, he was elected by people, you have to realize, who feel a large number of them feel the compelling necessity to own personal lethal weapons. Um, I think that alone is an indication of something that's not operating uh, properly, when you need to have a lethal weapon in order to make it, that's not the sign of being someone who is well adjusted. Um, the, I don't know what we can do. Those are the same, same people, I guess, can collectively get together for mutual self-protection. Anyhow, okay. uh, thanks for coming. I was All right. appreciate it. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. All right. A uh, couple of things to conclude. Um, you know, I decided to retire because I felt that, uh, you know, I was working for Department of Public Health, Chicago Department of Public Health. And I was giving presentations for the department. However, uh, when I would put a presentation together, it would be censored in a certain way. So ultimately, the mayor's team, as we called it, would have the final word on any presentation. And it was a very, you know, I discovered it was a very difficult process to go through. For example, I uh, had a presentation on hoarding that I uh, was giving. And when I originally did it, I had a slide, one slide, which showed a picture of the pet coke hoard out on the overlooking the 10th ward, the east side neighborhood. And I, you know, identified that as uh, a hoard, a, a hoarding problem, you know, greed, etc. behind it. And so I went and I gave the presentation and when uh, the public information officer found out that I had that slide in there, and the only thing that she wanted to know was, what did you say 
about that slide. No interest in particularly anything else. And actually, I didn't say very much other than the community had organized and had taken some action to try to improve that situation. Uh, so, uh, you know, I could retire, and I chose to do so in order to try to give uh, education out in the communities, and uh, I am looking forward to doing that in different uh, forums, different venues. I would also, uh, you know, conclude by saying, now that you have uh, Trump is the president, and you have a Republican Congress. Yuck. There's going to be some very significant changes in the way mental health is conceived and uh, offered. And it's probably, you can't be surprised if it becomes much more coercive. And I would say to anybody, you know, by all means, if you're having a breakdown, you're falling apart. Go in and you know try to get some medication to try to stop that from occurring just short term. But be careful about getting diagnosed and getting in the system. Because what they're going to probably move to is a cutback in uh, therapy and case management services. They're probably going to put a lot of people off of disability if you're on a psychiatric disability with major depressive disorder or perhaps bipolar disorder. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're going to be, the, the clinicians who attend to people are going to be under a lot of pressure to maybe turn people in to the system. And we know how out of control the system is at this point in time. At least I think most people who come to the college have a sense of that. And so, again, I, I would recommend that people become educated about mental health. Most mental health problems can be cleared up fairly, you know, I'm not going to say easily, but with due diligence, you know, if you really work on it, uh, you don't need to get yourself sucked into the system. And, uh, you know, we've had in historically all sorts of horrific, you know, interventions that psychiatry has come up with, both here in the United States and in the Soviet Union when it existed. And I you know, mention uh, you know, frequently, in the Soviet Union, they had a disorder that was called uh, sluggishly progressive schizophrenia. Sluggishly progressive, you know, kind of slow to really come to full fruition. And you got diagnosed with that if you were dissenting in the sense that you were talking about the Soviet Union as not being the most perfect system man ever designed. And that meant you could be removed with that diagnosis and forcibly have antipsychotic medications administered. Mental health can easily morph, you know, diagnoses can easily morph into a lot of coercion. And uh, hopefully that won't come uh, here, but, uh, you know, again, the purpose of my presentation was to kind of clue you in to diagnosis, uh, mental health uh, issues, and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you'll pass it on if you get a chance. Thank you very much. Okay, do you have a website or anything? Do you have, like, a website or social media yet? I do not have that, but I, I'm going to work on that. And any input from you would be helpful. Okay. Let's thank our speaker again. Adjourn the college. I have your attention, please. I have your attention, please. All right. One final note from Andy. Hello. Anybody in the back room there? Others. All right. I want to make a final announcement. All right, just, just, just shout it out, Eddie. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for maintaining an area of uh, a general or tone of civility tonight. Let's try to keep it going next week. Thank you much. We're, we're